Thanks for tuning in to this week's best of episode of The Kevin Roberts Show. As we close out 2022 and head into a new year, I wanted to reflect on my first year here at the Heritage Foundation and share a few of my favorite moments from the show. This best of installment is chock full of conservatives who know what time it is in America and who've also dedicated themselves to the fight to take this country back. I hope you enjoy this very special episode of The Kevin Roberts Show. Happy New Year. You lead what social scientists call an institution of civil society. But you don't wake up in the morning and say, this is an institution of civil society. Mm -hmm. You wake up and say, this is God's people with some differences and people who have had some challenges, some of them self-inflicted. And Bonton Farms is a place that more than anything else instills hope. Mm. And so many Americans take for granted because of the material comfort we have, but also the social comfort we have Mm. that everyone has hope. And when I visited Bonton and I met you for the first Mm. time and I visited with some of the people who work there and spent some time walking around the neighborhood, these are people who now have hope, mm. but they did not Ex- explain that for people who want to understand, but might be scratching their heads. Man, how can I get there without rambling? You know, well, I feel I, free to ramble. I, I uh, you know, when we first started the farm and we grew our first crop, I'm not a real farmer, by the way. And so it's like we, we're trying to do everything organically. So how do we do this? What do you do? I know it takes things from the soil to grow food. So how do you do that? And well, you read about it and most farmers let their land rest at fallow. We don't have any extra land. So I bought two tractor trailer loads of compost and had it delivered. And the day it was delivered, it started raining and rained for three days. So when we're finally going to be able to get to it, I gathered everybody around. We're going to have to do this. We had no equipment. So we're going to do it a shovel load at a time. And I told them, I said, I handed out packets of seeds and I said, look, all that food we grew all year didn't come without a cost. It took things. And if we don't put it back, we're going to wind up bankrupt. And so we're going to do this really hard job of taking this comp- uh, compost a shovel load at a time, putting in the garden. And when you're done, you're going to take those seeds you have in your hand and you're going to put them in that restored soil. And before long, that seed's going to look like a picture uh, on the packet you took it out of. And one of the guys looked back at me and he said, hey, your seeds are dead. I said, I just, bought, I just bought them. Why would you say that? And he said, because that's what dead things look like. They're shriveled up and dry. I like, well, I've never thought about that before, but I promise you, if you put that seed in good soil and you position it the way we have the garden where the sun passes overhead and you give it the right amount of water, that seed will almost assuredly become what it was created to be. And one of the ladies was crying. And I'm used to saying stupid stuff. You know, I'm, a, I'm in a different cultural context. So I'm always saying things and I'm having to back up and say, what did I do? And I said, I, help me understand. And she said, well, we're just like those seeds. Hmm. I'm like, I'm a dude. I still don't understand. <laughs> You're going to have to go a little slower for me. And she's like, well, we grew up here. And what was our son's soil and water? What, what did we have to build our life? And what she was saying were two things. She's not what she's done. You know, she grew up in a single mother household. Her father was incarcerated. Bonton was a really dangerous place. And so they knew when their dad came home from prison, things were going to get better for them. And instead, he was broken and abusive to the mom and molested the girls. And the only way this daughter felt um, uh, any self-worth was when men showed her affection. So she winds up getting prostituted out and hates herself for that. So she starts shooting up dope and then goes to prison. And now she's here teaching us this lesson. And there's and there's that cycle that millions of Americans have yeah. gone through in spite of the nobility of our, our noble aims of a yeah. republic. We're dealing with humans and human nature. And she's the one telling the story. Yeah. I mean, it is it's scriptural. And and really, Bonton Farms, truth be told, she founded it because we were building a house, a room at a time without any plan until she said that. And it slowed us down to say, what are sun, soil and water for people? And see, that's the problem with our inner cities is we created these spaces that have none of the tools or resources that we all use to build our life with, and they still don't. And so Bonton has, we believe, we call them human essentials. There are these six things that people um, that grow up in most inner cities don't have access to that are absolutely essential to human flourishing. And without those tools there, people, um, most people won't make it. What are those six? Economic development, you know, I know you know this, but in Dallas, we have almost half the population of our city living where only 5% of our jobs are. Um, Because we're isolated and separated, transportation, access to fresh, healthy food, because we're a food desert, um, health care, non-predatory lending or financial tools, and and education that prepares our kids to compete in a free market economy. How many communities in the country would you estimate 
have that problem? Thousands. We yeah. have 75 what they call in Dallas uh, infrastructure deserts, which means all of those things plus internet and sometimes uh, poor roads and sewer systems and all that. But there's 75 in Dallas County alone. So it's this, pervasive. Yeah, I mean, this, this is an American problem. Let me say this. 20% of every child born in the United States is now born into a place of poverty. You see, it's no longer a racial thing. It started that way. Now it's just a poverty thing. If you happen to be born into a zip code that doesn't have that to those tools and equipment, you are likely not to make it simply because of where you were born. And I think our country, we, we should do better than that. Well, we should. So mm -hmm. when I first met you, it was at the invitation of two mutual friends who were in the legislature, Matt Shaheen and Ron Simmons. We had a series of meetings and, and you and I hit it off that first time. But the, the, the point that I'm making there is that we show up, you know, we dress like we work in and around politics, okay. which you still smile about. <laughs> and we sat down and everyone tolerated us. And you knew we had a heartfelt interest in trying to figure out what was going on and how we could scale yeah. it, right? Mm. Because of the extent of the problem. Yeah. And one of the things you told me point blank, and of course the folks who were working at Bonton Farms told me too, was don't come here. And they meant this actually very politely, sure. but I said, be real with us. Don't come here in your suits, mm. learn what we're doing, go back to Austin to the state Capitol, write some stupid bill and think you fixed the problem, yeah. right? Yep. And you, almost every time I have seen you in person, we have talked, you have reminded me of that. And so it leads me to this question. We clearly have to fix this problem. It is one that I happen to believe as a as sort of a cultural conservative, if you will. That is to say, I want communities and neighborhoods and families to be so healthy that what we have to do in policy is so small. That's a very different way yep. of saying I'm limited government, right? Yep. It's, it's a way of saying government can be limited because government's people are flourishing, right. right? That's that's God's image. But to get to the question, Darren, it seems as if there's still a role for policy to play either at the state level or the federal level. Have you had any time over the last several years to give some thought to what that would look like? Yeah, I, I think it has to happen at every level. You know, when it comes to housing and where jobs are located and how health care is done and things like that, um, I think that's local city and county politics. Um, you know, we talk about criminal justice reform and property taxes and things like that. And I think that's state level and federal level. And then I think at some point as a country, we have to decide who we really are. And are we going to live into those principles that we were founded on? And if so, there needs to be a reckoning where the federal government has a program that says we're going to go into these forgotten places. It's a root cause issue. So our cities are drowning under homelessness. They're drowning under addiction and drugs. They're drowning in the to human trafficking and domestic abuse and and communities like Bonton feed into those disproportionately because our folks wind up in those situations. And so we need to fix that root cause and stop the bleeding. And uh, I think that's the role of the federal government to establish policy to say that we these underserved communities, these communities with no infrastructure are going to get a foundational uplift to see that they have the basic resources that human beings need to flourish. Well, and at the heart of that is, among other virtues, values, is the dignity of work, mm. which, I mean, that's just fundamentally human. And and it reminds me of a conversation we had across Heritage a couple of weeks ago, the day after Labor Day, where I mentioned, and many people are already talking about it, that if you think about the work that we do, and this is really going to be a point about Bonton Farms, not about Heritage, but it's instructive, I think. If you think about the work we do at Heritage, whether it's taxation policy or education policy or foreign policy, at the heart of that, I mean, the ultimate aim is human flourishing. But one of the symptoms of that, a good symptom, is that people understand that the reason they work isn't for money, although that can be good mm -hmm. if put to noble uses. It's for the dignity that comes from that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it seems to me, as I observed to my colleagues, that it, the more a think tank, as it were, can talk about the dignity of work. We humanize the policy that we're doing, mm -hmm. and it puts us in much closer contact with people like you and the folks in Bonton who are living this every day. I mean, I think I've read so much about what you've done, and I'm very familiar with it. That is one of the striking things, is that Bonton Farms is a very poignant reminder yeah. that the issues about flourishing and the dignity of work. Well, I think that, you know, that is something that is not up for debate. Um, uh, I, I believe that because biblically it says if a man doesn't work, you shouldn't eat. I mean, it's a, it's a principle. 
Um, the social sciences say that a huge part of human flourishing is predicated on work that has purpose and meaning and that we derive as human beings, our general nature is that we derive a portion of our dignity and purpose of who we are through our work. And if that's taken from somebody, then um, it, it has uh, horrible consequences. I see the commonalities in terms of the majority of these shooters, disaffected, disconnected um, young men as one of the symptoms of a body politic that has been trying to minimize the role of families and fathers and even masculinity for the better part of the last 60 years. Um, so I, I see that as one of the symptoms. I see a lot of the issues that we're having in education as a symptom, again, oftentimes of, of family breakdown and of parents who have discharged all of their responsibility for their children and given it over to the state. And the state um, willingly taking it on because people who believe in big government are always looking for problems to solve. Some of those problems occur naturally. Some of them they create so that they can be the people um, who, who come in and solve them, right? They're, they're like uh, an ADT salesman who uh, breaks a window in a neighborhood so that the, the scared residents say, hey, ADT, can you come in and put in a security system? Um, and in many ways, uh, that's, that's the way you know, some of our politicians function. Um, so, so anything having to do with the, the well-being of our children um, and the fact that so many of them are struggling, so many of them are on medications of one type or another, um, increasingly isolated, tethered to their phones at all times. I'm sure you've been out at restaurants. It's not, it's not just the teenagers, to be fair. I, I, I've been in the same boat. You'll have a family of five. Everyone, even down to the baby, is, is on a device. Um, these are all symptoms to me of a, of a body politic that's sick. And I think part of it is because, um, and, and, I, and I use that, that metaphor in terms of, I, I, I talk about the body politic, but when I talk about it, I'm actually thinking of a body. And if, if you were a surgeon who found that all of your patients were missing vital organs, at a certain point, you should ask the question, where are the hearts? Where are the lungs? You know, where, where's the muscle fiber? What, what, what happened? Why are all these patients missing these things? Because um, when those things are not there, problems are going to uh, ensue. And I think one of the things that you've seen in our country is that certain parts of the body have, have grown very large and then other parts have atrophied completely. Um, and, and I know, again, I know we're going to talk more about the family, but I tend to focus in on the family, um, and particularly marriage and fa natural, the natural family, one man, one woman in one covenant union for one lifetime committed to one another and the children that they raise together. That's the building block of society, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of social scientists like Brad Wilcox. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you're familiar yep. with his work. My friend, uh, Kevin Stewart in Texas, who does similar work to Brad's, who, who just showed through their studies that what you just said is, is slam dunk true. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, Someone has the right to disagree with that, but right. the, the data would not back up their disagreement, exactly. right? And and it, it strikes me just as a as a related aside as I'm I'm listening to you diagnose this, Delano. That's the computer engineer in you. Yes, that those of us who are <laughs> th those of us who are liberal arts guys mm -hmm. just say this is the problem. There's some correlation, so right. there's got to be causation. You you're a guy who's really picking it apart, and therefore, and, and I really do mean this. You just like the sociologist, like like Brad Wilcox. I think can lead us to a solution. Hmm. And so you and I can talk about policy. We can talk right. about some of the research, which I know you've got at your fingertips. But the thing that really strikes me about what you do is that you and your family are heavily invested in the community that you live in. Right. And and I to me, as a historian, and more of a social historian than anything, that's really the beauty of America because that's the beauty of human nature in any mm -hmm. society, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's Barbados or mm -hmm. America mm -hmm. or Eastern Europe or, or, or parts of Latin America. So how do we get from this pretty dire diagnosis, this dire reality, which I think you've depicted accurately, to fixing it? Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to say one thing because you, you talked about community and, and um, I'm, I'm thinking back to my story, right? How I was talking about how I grew up. And, and I'll, I'll share a short sort of story that ties in a lot of these things. I remember having distinctly as a kid, my family, we would go to the carnivals that were put on by the Sons of Italy. Now, anybody who knows about Queens, particularly this part of Queens, I grew up, was called Rosedale, Queens. Um, Bill Morris did 
a documentary, I think it was called The Way Things Used to Be, and it talked about Rosedale and some of the racial tension that they had there. I mean, to the point there were cross burnings in the late 70s in, the, in that neighborhood as working class Italian and Irish families were moving. Um, some were moving out and then working class black families were moving in and there was tension there. But to me, having my immigrant family, right, black people from the Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, wherever, going to the Sons of Italy Festival, where I first learned what Zeppelis were, and them welcoming us and us benefiting from the community that they had built with those lodges that other people experience, you know, in other parts of the country, that to me is like the quintessential American story, right? So it's, it's yes, we may be from different tribes, quote unquote, but that doesn't mean that we can't um, get along and, and, and work together and live together as neighbors. So when it comes to addressing some of these things, again, I, th I think the breakdown of the family um, is, is obviously one of the big factors. And it's not just a natural disintegration. A lot of it is active and attacks and antagonism towards the family from um, big government and the state. So I think one of the things that we have to do is to publicly identify that problem and then work through policy and culture to wake that part of the body up. I'll, I'll say it to people like this, if, and people I think after working from home for the last couple of years would, would appreciate this. If you've been sitting at your desk for eight hours straight and your leg falls asleep, you don't smack yourself in the head for 30 minutes. You tap your leg because you have to tap the part of the body that's fallen asleep to get it to wake up. And in the same way, I think we need to do that for the family. So again, that could be policy interventions. Um, that can be using culture, the organs of culture, to promote positive messages, um, big business, social media. There are all different ways that we can you know, activate that part of the body that needs to wake up. Um, as I said, I started writing for a site called Black and Married with Kids. That couple used documentaries. Um, I think they did at least five documentaries on marriage and manhood, on generational wealth. I actually met my wife at the third documentary screening. We didn't know each other. We happened to sit on the same row. But then they went on to do something more. They started marriage cruises. So there would be 60, 70 couples from across the country. Some even came internationally. And we would be on a seven-day cruise. And in between stops, um, you know, when, when we were just out to sea for an entire day, We'd have sessions on communication, on blended family, on entrepreneurship, on, on wealth creation. Like those are tangible things that this couple did to help people build and sustain their marriages. Um, so I, I think th there are a number of ways to do it, but I think the big part is, is addressing it. And I, I'm thankful for conservatives because conservatives will say, just, just you, know, you, you said this in the beginning, like the family is the building block, all right? The, the RNC um, platform of 2016 and 2020 had an entire section talking about the natural family as the building block of, of civic society. When I went to the Democratic Party platform and I, and I did a word search on family or marriage, the only time they talk about marriage is as it relates to arranged marriages in foreign countries. That's it. It's telling. It's telling. And, and, that, and that shows the difference in, in, on the two sides, right? One believes in family and the role of, of marriage and uh, fathers in terms of um, pr providing for and protecting for women and children. And the other believes in the government as everyone's dad. And I've said this before, um, the, the government is a, is a terrible husband and an absent father because it just has too many households to support. Um, and it's one of those things where we just, we need to get back to the natural order as it relates to the role of, uh, particularly of men in a society. Um, and I think part, the first step in that is naming that um, as something that is, a, is a, that is an ideal. And it's harder and harder in American <laughs> life, especially in media, mm -hmm. to name that, right? Mm -hmm. that, that just saying that, just diagnosing a reality <laughs> that everyone knows, it, it, it doesn't matter what demographic group someone's mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. socio socioeconomic, racial, whatever the case may be, it's a reality mm -hmm. that the nuclear family is an objective fact that the nuclear family has deteriorated in the last two generations of the mm -hmm. United States. 
it is, I guess, debatable, but social scientists would argue and show data that there are there is a crisis in masculinity. Oh, None absolutely. of this, you know, macho masculinity that's 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 was depicted for a generation in Hollywood, but the kind of masculinity that is just as important as proper femininity mm. and the complementarity of that mm -hmm. in the building block of of society, the family is assailed not just in the airwaves, but it's assailed in congressional hearings now. Yeah, yes. For at least 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, the, the, the term conservatism has been um, conflated with uh, – uh, with, with globalism, mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's right. Many, many conservative, many people who call themselves conservatives, um, when they say conservative, they're either referring to a personal liberal libertarianism, just freedom is really the the only important thing, right? Or they're referring to um, uh, a globalist neoliberalism, which says um, not only is freedom the only important thing, but we know how the entire world should be governed, e even to the point of imposing it on others. Right, and so those sort of twin um, versions of you know what calls itself conservatism, the the libertarian version and the and the globalist version, those became so dominant in the last thirty years that uh, when when we started. Organizing these um, the, these conferences for you know basically for uh, uh, for uh, dissenters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the first one we did was uh, was in December 2016, a month after Trump was uh, was elected. And when we started doing this, it, I mean, it, it was very obvious that you know it, you, you could say, well, we're the true conservatives, but that's so obnoxious. Yeah, you know, I mean, is. it's just, it I really mean, is. You know, some people. Some people talk like I, yeah. I, I just I can't stand it. It's it's just yeah. so offensive. So, um, so we just thought that look b between neoconservatism, sort of in the center of the political map, and uh, on on the far right, there's all these groups that focus on race. Mm -hmm. So in the center, there are people who focus almost exclusively on the individual, and on the far mm -hmm. right, there's people who focus on race. In between, there's this vast, gigantic space where the you know the great majority of of you know people who are you know intuitively conservative, who who tend to vote conservative, the great majority mm -hmm. are sitting in between in this That's gigantic right. space, and nobody they they didn't get the memo, they didn't know <laughs> that the nation was you know a national independence had you know ceased to be central to conservatism, and um, and and so we decided that to distinguish neocons from natcons just to, to make it clear that this that this is a change in direction and uh and that we're inviting people to join us in that change of direction so so we we adopted national conservative or nationalist conservative and uh, basically what it means um in short is um is uh no it's not just about the individual and the entire globe mm -hmm. um, it's about the family it's about the nation mm -hmm. it's about national interests and national traditions mm -hmm. and and these all of these things mean very real policy changes mm -hmm. thank you for that explanation that I, I was smirking a little bit in uh, celebration of your persuasiveness because what our audience will now know is you've been working on me recently to um, be less stubborn about my maxim that no adjective should be in front of the word conservative so now you're laughing and we could maybe get some some comments from from audience over the next months and years about that but you make a persuasive case and and so we can we can move on from there and and how i'd like to move on is to ask you the follow-up question that it seems as if just in our lifetimes that what has replaced the concept of the nation state properly defined in conservatism has been the free market that we and of course we love the free market and be really clear that you do as well but it seems as if those two things concept of nation state or nationalism and free market got inverted so, such that whether it's in foreign policy or domestic policy to be a conservative say from the late 80s or early 90s until the mid 2010s was to place first and foremost ahead of family ahead of faith ahead of all of of these important institutions in life the free market am i mistaken no i i think that's right i i, I would just add that um that i that the view that the free market which which 
you know, as as you emphasize, um, I and all of my colleagues mm -hmm. were, were raised on the free market. The, you know, n none of us are socialists. Right. None of us, you know, think that there's some kind of ideal of you know rational central planning that should govern any economy. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not there, but um, but I think uh, a responsible conservatism has always uh, been about balancing different principles mm -hmm. and. Um, you know that there are different different formulations in in in, sure. in, uh, in in the book. I look at the preamble of the American Constitution of 1787, and I th there's seven different purposes of government there, and only one of them is is individual liberty. Um, so th there are different formulations, but I think a simple, compelling way to think about it. Um, uh, Irving Kristol, mm -hmm. um, uh, who had a huge impact on me and my friends in the 1980s. Uh, Irving Kristol used to talk, uh, used to say that uh, that modern conservatism rests on three pillars: um, religion, nationalism, and economic growth. And of the three, mm -hmm. he would say that religion is the, the most important. I mean, he's he's famous. He published a book called Two Cheers for for Capitalism." Yep. And it's not because he didn't appreciate uh, the immense worth and, and importance of economic freedoms. He did. But everything needs to be balanced, and his argument was, and and this is the same argument that that I continue to make, and I think most of my colleagues do do as well, is is that um, it's utopian to believe that mm. the single principle of individual liberties is capable of doing everything we need to do, and it's it's utopian, it's false, it's just it's mm -hmm. it's just not not true, and so we need religion and. The focus on the nation, in order to give us the the uh, the, the proper boundaries of the market, mm -hmm. you know, which you can't you can't just figure it out by by you know just reasoning about it. You need yeah. you need by experience to to uh, to ask what do we need to do in order to be able to conserve and transmit valuable, precious, important things from the past to future generations, and. Uh, and religion and nationalism, Crystal said, the, the, those are the, the the two things that allow us to transmit things. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the market, uh, in and of itself, by itself, mm -hmm. um, it 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 doesn't it has no loyalty to the mm -hmm. past. It it's always changing. I mean, that's mm -hmm. you know that's what's good about it. Yep. But it also acts as a solvent. It actually. If it's the only principle, then it works to destroy the family and the nation. That, that's what we're seeing today. Well, we really are. And, and heck, we could spend a couple of hours just diagnosing that. And again, just to be clear for your sake and, and for that matter, for mine and for all of us at, at Heritage, as an example, we're not denigrating the free market. We're just saying that for a generation or so, we conservatives have, have really um, mis- placed it, uh, that it really is at the service of the nation, at the service of the family, rather than the other yes. way around. So Jaffa thought that the Civil War was a kind of world historical event because mm -hmm. it proved the possibility of a govern government by the consent of the people, that a government based on equal natural rights was actually possible. But he came to his understanding of Lincoln and of America through the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and that is a, an interesting little story. So when Jaffa was a young graduate student in New York studying with the great Leo Strauss, mm. he had been reading Plato's Republic, which is this famous dialogue about the nature of justice. And Socrates mixes it up with this other character that Plato talks about uh, called Thrasymachus. And Thrasymachus was a, a conventionalist, or we might today say a moral relativist. I guess, I guess the kids think that's kind of cringe to say relativism. <laughs> you could say positivism, but the idea that- We could say relativism. Yeah, yes. Yeah. But the idea that morality changes mm -hmm. with time or that it depends on what culture you live in. And Socrates said, no, there is justice by nature. There mm -hmm. is a, such a thing as natural right. And he refuted the conventionalist or, or relativism of this other guy through mm -hmm. some things. So Jaffa absorbed all that. And then about a year later, he's in this used bookstore in downtown Manhattan, and he's flipping through a copy of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And he's seeing that Lincoln and Douglas running for the Senate, the Senate, Senate seat in Illinois in 1858, discussing the, the question of slavery and the morality of slavery are reproducing that argument that Plato shows in the Republic more than 2000 years ago. And Joffa said, that's when I realized that what Strauss had said about the permanent questions about truth, about morality, about justice 
as permanent uh, features of human life. That's what brought it home to him. Mm -hmm. when he saw Lincoln and Douglas having that same debate that he read about in the Republic. Well, it is fascinating. And so there are multiple strands there in that response. And I'm going to come back to the strand that relates to Jaffa particularly, but I want to, I want to sustain a really eloquent point you've made a couple of times about equality. What is the import of that academic realization that Jaffa made to 2022? Right. So um, Jaffa always thought and, and followed Lincoln in this, that believing that um, equality has to be the central principle mm -hmm. of understanding American republicanism, in part because it is the thing that connects us to the idea of natural right. And natural mm -hmm. right can be kind of a complicated term in academic or, or the philosophical world, but it means the idea that there is some enduring truth, right? Mm -hmm. So to the, to the degree that all human beings are equally human, or all members of the same human species, uh, that means that from that idea follows all the other ideas. Mm -hmm. So because you're not superior to me by nature, because nature did not mark you out as the queen bee is marked out among the bees, that means you can't rule me without my consent. Right. And that equality is our access to this classical idea that there is something permanently true or right by nature. And that idea of natural right informs everything else about America, according to Jaffa. So here we said that we're recording this in the summer of 2022, where there are a lot of Supreme Court decisions coming out. <clears throat> One of them in particular uh, will be out this summer, perhaps even within days of, of our recording this. We could take a step back from the timeliness of that, because you're talking about something that is timeless, this, this understanding. For any center-right American, whatever label they'll use to describe themselves, is they think about decisions the Supreme Court has made over the last decade. So much of that, at least rhetorically, has to do with equality. Jaffa lived a very long life. Um, he was in his 90s by the time he passed away. So he's, he's a contemporary of ours, even, even sitting here. But the, the point is, what would he make of how equality is used almost as a trope in American politics. Yeah. So it bothered him a lot mm -hmm. that it had been basically completely transformed into almost its opposite. And, right. and so he had a lot of battles with um, some of the traditionalists, some of the paleoconservatives mm -hmm. who said, no, 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 human beings are not equal. Uh, this neglects the, the ways in which human beings are, are unequal. And Jaffa always recognized that and always pointed out that political equality, the natural equality that we have, that the idea that we have the same rights by nature is the opposite of egalitarianism or mm -hmm. equal outcomes. There's a wonderful passage uh, in Federalist 10 where Madison says that the purpose of American constitutionalism is to protect the unequal faculties of acquiring property. Mm -hmm. So because we have equality of rights, because we have political equality, that's supposed to lead to unequal outcomes. That's not a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> Today's left-wing equity is literally the exact opposite of that. Equity assumes that we're unequal, right? Because mm -hmm. we're members of certain groups, right? So members of certain classes. And it's the government, the government's job to take that inequality and make us all equal through this mandated form of, of equity and equal outcomes. So it's literally the reverse of what Jefferson and Lincoln were talking about. What's our way out of that? I mean, we're going to get into the, some big questions. That's certainly one of them. But by that, I mean politically or maybe even in terms of policy. What's our way out of that? Which, and it's not a dilemma. I mean, this, to, to use a word that is overused in our modern parlance, it is existential to the very ideal of the American Republic. Right. Yeah. So the way out of that, in a way, uh, is, not, is not so easy to figure out. Yeah. I, I mean, what, uh, a, a, a kind of a cop-out answer is to say we need statesmanship, right? Yeah. There has to be someone who has the political skill, the political insight, the ability to speak to people, the ability to maneuver politically, to bring uh, different factions and interests to bear, uh, who has the skills of a Lincoln or a Winston mm -hmm. Churchill. There's no substitute for that. Uh, you know, I've been affiliated with the Claremont Institute for a long time. And one of the things in our mission statement is the study of statesmanship and political philosophy, because mm -hmm. there's no substitute ultimately for statesmanship. You can teach people, you can prepare the ground, but you can't, that person has to emerge on his own. So in a way, uh, I'm not sure what the solution, what the solution is until a statesman uh, emerges. Uh, I don't think that's so much of a cop out answer. Yeah, I'll um, let you off the hook a little okay, bit. Okay, okay, good. Because there's no substitute for political skill. Yeah, that's uh, right. Just to solve political problems. Our founders relied on that. I mean, they they Absolutely. assumed that would always exist. Right? Absolutely. But the other component of that is the statesman needs something to work with, and so yeah. 
all of these groups on the right, Heritage, Claremont, all the others, have to continue their work of teaching people, educating people, so that when the statesman comes along, he can speak to people in a way they understand. So they understand what these concepts are. Um, uh, on, on, a, on a lower level, I'd say both the left has already become so tribal. And the thing I would warn the right against, and I, I see this a lot with younger people, you know, you, you talk about the dissident right or the alt right or younger, the Twitter frogs, as they're called sometimes online, they're so cynical mm -hmm. uh, about what's happened that they're retreating into a rejection of constitutionalism, of republicanism, of equality, rejecting all the principles of the founding and retreating in, into, into a kind of alternate tribalism, right? So the right. left wants to become tribal. And so they think, well, we'll become our own tribal faction. And I don't think that's the answer. I don't think that can, that can save the republic. <laughs> I, I agree with you there, and and I, I mean this just for the sake of illumination, not for for naming names. But by that description, are you referring to the integralists on our side? So that's that's one. Yeah. So I think the withdrawal from politics, the mm -hmm. idea that we can simply form little communities and hold out, uh, there is no escaping politics. Yeah. One, of, one of Aristotle's lessons is we are by nature political animals. We live in political communities, mm -hmm. and the idea that we can simply withdraw and ride it out. That's no answer at all. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you, we didn't talk about this before in the show prep, but our audience may know because I talk about it occasionally when I was president of Wyoming Catholic College, which was by its founding and something that I had celebrated and celebrate present tense, truly reactionary. I mean, that's, that, that is a factual statement, a reaction right. to the culture that there was this belief by very smart, well-intentioned people at the college and, and some supporters of the college to adopt what our, our friend Rod Dreher would say was the Benedict option. And I, I, I said, well, while I understand that spiritually, I, it, even then it's not correct. And, and for those of us who adhere to that particular faith, it's theologically incorrect because we are called to be the leaven in this life for people right. who are less overtly religious than people at Wyoming Catholic. I would say exactly what you said, which is that we concede the political realm at our peril. Yes. We're living through that right now, right? Right, right. Exactly. Uh because if you simply turn over uh, all the institutions of power to the left, there won't be any place to retreat to. <laughs> <laughs> because unlike our side, leftists wield the power they yes. have. And then some, right? Right, right. And they have no intention of leaving us alone. Yeah. The idea that you can simply withdraw uh, assumes that there's a space to withdraw to. <laughs> but the left doesn't have any intention of leaving any such space. One of the things that on that point that you write about eloquently, not just in the book about Jaffa, but in, in your many essays, is the, the, the demise of most American institutions. And I was sharing with you before we started recording that that's really where a lot of my own thinking is, that, you know, for what it's worth. Obviously, Heritage has always contributed to that conversation, hopefully in a helpful way. But uh, as, just as a, as a historian myself, I think we're living through what seems to me to be like the 1760s. And by that, I mean, and you can, of course, say, no, Kevin, you're wrong. But by that, I mean, a run up to some big inflection point that what did become the American Revolution. I hope that it's there's no bloodshed. I'm going to be really clear about that. Right. But what I really mean by that is that we are realizing that the institutions, just as today, just as those in the 1760s, had been co-opted by people with a different set of values, different debate, different circumstances. I understand that history, as we know, doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm grappling with just personally, and, and many of us at Heritage are having this conversation, is that here in the 2020s, whether later this decade or the next decade, we are going to have an inflection point in this history where we either have to seize back the institutions that have been taken or we have to start new ones. What's Claremont's awesome about this. What, what's your sense of this? I think that's exactly right. So I've been saying now for quite a while that conservatism is really not the right term to use anymore. Mm -hmm. When we've lost so many of our institutions, when the culture has become so corrupt and degraded, when the left controls uh, not just the whole federal bureaucracy, many of the states, but nonprofits, academia, mm -hmm. popular culture, increasingly all these woke corporations, right? That's not a status quo we want to conserve, right? right? That we can't continue and maintain our liberties. We have to get back. And so the, the phrase I've been using, which has been a little controversial sometimes, is we have to behave like counter-revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. We have to take back the institutions. We have to rebuild. We have to recapture our founding principles. And so uh, I think the, the, both the mindset and the phrase conservatism is not a useful way mm -hmm. to think about our politics anymore. 
Uh, we have to think much more aggressively and think radically. Um, you know, people get alarmed by the word radical, but the Latin root, uh, the Latin root is root. Uh, and, and one of the things I wanted to do in my book is show the roots, uh, show the basic fundamental questions, uh, which Joffa spent his whole life exploring. What is the basis of Republican government? What does equality mean and why is it understood? And what does it mean properly? What does consent mean? What, mm -hmm. what are our equal natural rights and, and where does that come from? What are, what are the philosophical arguments behind all those things? And I think those questions have immense importance right now. And it seems to me that the demise of most institutions is directly correlated to the possibility that we may not have as many people practicing the statesmanship that you understand, right? In other words, just to borrow a little bit from de Tocqueville, if he were sitting here in this conversation, there has to be the context in which the institutions in which that kind of statesmanship can be formed. I mean, this, right. this, is, this is part of our civic responsibility as many generations of Americans, not just in the founding generation, but all the well into the 20th century understood. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Kevin Roberts Show. If you left feeling inspired that America's best days are ahead of her, I hope you'll share this message with your friends and family. And also consider leaving a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to this podcast. We here at Heritage want to be with you every step of the way as we continue to grow the conservative movement. Thanks for being part of the show and see you next week.